We are so pleased to be able to introduce tonight's guests, Kathleen mm -hmm. McGee Anderson and Duke Fakara. Duke Fakara had a wonderful conversation about his book, I'll Be There, My Life with the Four Ties. One of the things that I wanted to ask Duke about was about the men who influenced his career and his relationship with Obi, Levi, and Lawrence. And I wanted to know more. The moment that we did come together and start singing, it's something magical happened. Duke had a strong bond with the other members of the Four Tops, a strong bond of love and brotherhood that was never broken. We looked at each other after we started singing and seemed like we knew this song and rehearsed it for years. I also wanted to ask Duke about when he first started out with Motown, how Barry Gordy discovered him, how he first signed the deal with Motown and started to work with the famous songwriting team of HDH, Holland, Dozier, and Holland. They were Motown. excited. I mean, yeah. wow, we're going to have our own label at, with Motown? We were sky high. Anywhere you go in the world, you will know about Motown. I kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. I have a lot of memories about the Motown sound, and I came here today to see what the actual story was. He talks a lot. Got lots of stories to tell. A lady that walked by and she said, oh my God, boy, look at all the angels around you. I can see where you're going. She said, you're going to be singing forever. We love the library. We love what we do and we love Detroit. We will love for you all to come back to the library. Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to our first ever indoor event since 2020, and we thank you all for coming. And what a joy that we have. The two people have written a book about an era in this city. I grew up with this music, and I'm just so pleased to be able to introduce tonight's guest, Kathleen. McGee Anderson and Duke Pacara, who is the last member of the Four Tops. We are so pleased that you all could be here with us and that you will not be disappointed about a book that I think is written in a way that is as though you all are sitting there in conversation. So welcome all and thank you. Let's give a round of applause for our guests. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Well, we'd like to certainly thank uh, the young lady and, and all the representatives from the library here for inviting us to do this, because this is probably the first time we've done anything like this. It is. And it should be fun. It is. We are, I've been knowing her most of my life, well, ever since I met my wife, mm -hmm. who was sitting back there. They were schoolmates, and Cass, and mm -hmm. then on to Spellman. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, I hear yeah. you, go right ahead. Yeah. 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 Actually, Piper and I met at camp. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, before we were at CAS, we went to Camp Cavell. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so. So she's been a lifelong friend, mm -hmm. pretty much. In mm -hmm. fact, as I, as I was thinking about writing, writing the book, and I was trying to think, well, who can I get to write this? And my wife said, well, what about Kay? I said, I don't, I don't know why I couldn't think of that. <laughs> well, that's because she was so far away in California then. And I just wouldn't think that you would really want to or be able to. Do, but do. she was more than <laughs> more than happy to do it, excited. And she is a great writer. I mean, she writes what you feel, what you say, and it's the truth. That's all I can say. And she does a good job of, of doing it. So it's really good to me because it's all in the family. And I like that kind of stuff anyway. You know, being with a group that's been together for 44 years, before they start going home. I'm used to closeness and family and all those kind of things. So every time that I can get involved or, get, or something gets involved with me and his family, it's a go. <laughs> it's really a go. And well, usually you know, it's a you win. You didn't have to ask me twice. I, I, I know that you, you just jumped it. right at it. I really was, I was wondering shocked. what was taking you so long. 
I, I, I didn't think about it. And I it. didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to bug you about it, but I knew you were looking for somebody to write your book. Yes, but you know what? I thought you were more into thinking about, you know, doing those sitcoms and all those things. True, And true. I didn't think you'd be thinking about Lonely Duke in Detroit, oh. you know what I mean? Duke, my first love is Detroit. I, I know that now. And I grew up with the tents and the tops. I think yeah. the reason that Piper and I got sent to Spelman, we got sent to Spelman. Why was that? Because we were so crazy about Motown and the music, and we were hanging out on the scene, and I think we could have st taken one more step and become groupies. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So both our mothers are educators, and they put their heads together and shipped us to Spelman. Oh, wow, what a great ship that was. Well, we didn't know how I'm lucky glad. we were. I'm glad you, they did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and then some time passed. Piper came back to Detroit, and some time passed, and she got in touch with me. We're best friends from childhood, and she said, KK, I'm getting married. I said, well, this is great, Piper. She yeah. said, I'm marrying Duke Fakir. <laughs> I went, my God, the four tops? Yeah, I was so was, happy for her. Well, and, uh, marrying Piper was a lifesaver for me. She's actually literally pretty much saved my life. Mm -hmm. She turned my life back around to where it should be, you know, thinking of family and all those wonderful things that, that are the greatest things on earth is thinking about family and the good life and, and not the hanging out and the bar and the this and that. That, that almost drove me underground. Un I mean, under the ground. <laughs> uh, but she really, she really saved me. And I, I, I talk about it all the time, and I don't mind saying it, you know. She made it, she said, Duke, you gotta make a choice. She says, you cannot keep doing this, drinking, hanging out, and doing the, the, she says, cause that's really not you. She said, now it's gonna be that or me. I said, well, I, I, ain't no second thought about who it's going to be. <laughs> I said, I said I'm, I'm certainly going your way. But, in, you know, she, and she really helped me out a lot. She doctored my mind and all that kind of things. That's just a total help. You and know. she brought you back to church. Can you tell that story? Yeah, I know yeah. that you were looking for a church home, and that's a wonderful part of the book, but can we hear yeah. about that? Well, well, you know, I, I loved her mother. Her mother was a great educator. And, and once I finally met her, it took me a couple of years before I could go in that house and meet because her. Because she wasn't into entertainers. Oh, I know. Right. She okay. wasn't into entertainers at all. And Piper had told me two couple of years before I went in there, she said, I said, well, when I'm going to meet your mother? When I'm going to meet your family? She said, please. She said, you're not going to be able to meet my mama, maybe for a while or maybe ever. I don't know. <laughs> so, so we kind of around you know but on the road I would call her and talk to her three four hours a night and all those kind of things uh, we became very very close very good friends and you know actually immediately I knew I wanted to marry her and I'm gonna tell you I just got through just come off a terrible relationship with my first wife and I swore I just didn't have the Bible in front of me that I was women fit, I'm just going to be a single man and just forget it. And we were in the studio in Motown. We were recording Still Waters Run Deep. How nice is that? <laughs> and I looked over there. I said, damn, who is that cute girl over there? It was more than, she was more than cute. Uh, it was something about her mm -hmm. and her attitude and her poise. Mm -hmm. And it just knocked me down. Mm -hmm. And so I say, do you think I could meet her? I said, yeah, just go over there and say hello to her. So after we recorded, I went over and met her. I said, hey, hello, I'd like to meet you. My name is Duke Kia. She said, I know you. I said, well, what is your name? She said, I'm Piper. I said, wow. I said, I have to tell you, are you an amazing looking woman? And I, I think you're amazing. I just see an aura around you that's, that's just taken me. She said, oh, you got to be kidding. I said, no, I'm serious. I said, may I see you again? She said, well, I, I might come back tomorrow. Are you all recording or tomorrow? I said, yes. She said, I might come back tomorrow if I can, you know. She said, I might have to study because I'm still in school. I said, oh, that's great. I said, what school you go to? She said, Spelman. I said, ooh, Spelman girl. <laughs> well, you know, we'd heard a lot about Spelman. And we were always proud of when we heard of any woman that came out of Spelman. Because they always were well, I, I won't say trained, but 
They were well, they were poised, they were intelligent, they had direction, they just had the good, the good stuff in life. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I was just taken when she said Spelman. So the next day I did ask her, she come back and we finished recording. And I said, well, may I take you to dinner or take you out or something? She said, okay. So we went to dinner and we started talking. Uh, and we started getting very personal. She says, she says, you don't know me that well. And I said, look, I know you the woman I need and I want, and I want you forever, case closed. And the relationship went on from there, from there, so. Well, what I love about that story and what I love about you, your life is that you love very deeply, you know? Yes. And that's one of the themes in the book. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the themes in the musical that we're working on. Yes, um, it is true. That's to be produced next year. Yeah, that's okay. working on it now. Oh, by the way, uh, we, July the 2nd, we'll be 48 years married. So, <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. And the thing that struck me when I was doing all the interviews, and I knew this a bit about you before we started doing those hours and hours of interviews for mm -hmm. the many, many wonderful sessions we yeah, had. Yeah, I won't call them interviews. We just sat and talked, and didn't we? We just had fun. We just went back we, and we started talking about how it all started. And we just kept talking until, you know, it took three, about three days, didn't it? Yeah, and it just flowed. Yeah. And you had done a lot of interviews before. Yes. Before I signed on. You did. So I had the benefit of other recorded interviews, I and you. you're a good storyteller, so it made it pretty well, easy. When you stick to the truth, it ain't hard to keep telling the same story. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's when, it's when you jump the line and go over here and go over there. Well, they say, well, that's another story well, no, entirely. Okay, it. no, I'm right. not going to go there. Okay, so. Um, here comes the interview, folks. No, I want to quote something from the book. Oh, okay. Because one of the things that strikes me about you and in trying to figure out all the narrative storylines in Duke's life is what is the, what are some of the themes that people really want to connect with, people will connect with. Mm -hmm. And one of them is love, and one of them is love for your father, your best friend, your brother. Mm -hmm. We don't hear a lot about men's love stories. I got you. We don't hear a lot about black men who love each other. Right. You know, I got and you. you and the other tops were so tight. We there were was such a bond. We you were never in, broke we were up. in love and we all were married and had babies, but we were in love. Yeah. In a masculine way. And I had not really uh, I'd not re experienced that before with yeah. that kind of and and we all Four were kind of street guys at, at, at the age we were in high school, but we were like what you call it, nice nasty. <laughs> you were, you know, we were great in school, but we were street guys. And but the moment that we did come together and start singing, it's something magical happened. Honestly, and we all felt it. Now Levi, he had been singing as a solo and always wanted to be a soloist until that night. And hmm. me and him had become friends, which you'll see in the book, before, before that night. Uh, and we looked, at, looked and looked at each other after we started singing, and it seemed like we knew this song and rehearsed it for years. I mean, it was just so tight harmonically, and it was so tight that Levi kept looking back and laughing, and then he really started singing for real. And, 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 we, and we did a great job that night, even though we really came there for the girls. The Scheherazade was a club of really fine Detroit women. Uh, most of them from Persian. There was a few from Cass, I think, even, yeah, yeah. That, was in, that was in that. Um, it was a graduation so we, party, right? Yeah, it was a graduation party. And we just went there as uh, 17, 18 year olds, you know, to be part of the party. You know, sex, singing was just secondary. You know, checking out the girls, that was the big deal then, because they were, all of them was fine. Every last one of them. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, you know. So we had fun that night, but the, but the thing that st stuck in our mind, even after we got through singing, is that we needed to sing together and rehearse starting the next day. And that's what we did. And we were more amazed once we started singing together. But I think all of you in some way had a musical background, like oh, Levi's yeah. cousin was 
Jackie, Jackie Wilson. Wilson, right? Mm -hmm. And you said that whenever you went past Lawrence's front porch, his uncles were they on the front They would be playing porch guitar singing, right? and singing from right? gospel, blues, yeah. pop. They sang everything, all his uncles. And of course, he was, he was part of that. He'd be the little boy singing. Yeah. Uh, what we found out once we really started rehearsing was that there were four qualities, separate qualities that wow. really made one whole. You know, mm. Lawrence Payton had a musical ear of a musical teacher. He knew every chord, every note, and he just heard it in his head. So it shocked us when we first started rehearsing. He said, fellas, I want, I want us to learn this song. It's September in the Rain. He said, Duke, I want you to sing this, because he knew I was a tenor. And he sung my whole part all the way through. Mm -hmm. I looked at him. I mean, I had, I had a pretty good ear. I looked at him and said, is, is this nigga crazy? <laughs> is, right. is, he, is he for real? Yeah. Then when he sung everybody else's part, because it sounds different. You know, when you sing in harmonic parts to people and you don't, have, you don't hear the melody, it sounds weird. Yeah. But we all had pretty good ears. So we kind of latched on to our part. And when we start singing those notes together, it was like four violins mm. in harmony, mm. uh, four uh, woodwinds. Uh, you know, it, it was just mm. beautiful. Mm. And we had those young voices also mm -hmm. was a big help. So we just became... Uh, ecstatic. Right then and there, we knew something greater than us was in the air for us. It was something that we were meant to do. We were put together. We were meant. You know what? Mm. Somebody looked up the names. Did I send you that? Yeah. yeah. That was amazing. Yeah, how how yeah. those names kind of from all four parts came of out, the, and they were all the world. godly. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's fascinating. Not only that, each name represented a quarter of the world, like yeah. Abdul yeah. Fakir, that's my real name. Uh, that's from the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. uh, Levi Stubbs, that's from the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. uh, Ronaldo Benson, that's from the Spanish-speaking world. And then Lawrence Payton, you know, just all American, all English. You know, as English as you can yeah, get. Yeah, but that's, Payton, that was four corners Payton. of the earth right there. Uh, it's amazing. There's so many little things that happen that I'll be uh, very honest, that I knew we had nothing to do with it. Well, you feel like in a way there was some sort of a magical, spiritual, ordained force that was, um, you know, directing or had a hand on this. Well, yeah, yes. And I don't want to give away the musical, and it's yeah. in the book. Or yeah, well, the book, I'm, yeah. But what about the lady in white? And women well, in well, general, which I want to talk about. But we the used the lady, white. the lady in white was, when I walked out of my church, when, I could not sing a song, finish a song that my mother, as the choir leader and the piano player, asked me to sing this song. And you song. were six or seven? Huh? You were little, seven yeah, years old? Yeah, maybe eight. So okay. the note, but I was young, very mm -hmm. young. And I had a real clear, nice tenor voice. He said, Duke, you have a wonderful voice. I want you to sing a solo. And I let her know. I said, Mama, I don't like singing solos. You know, I sang in every choir in school. I sang in the choir in church. I love harmonies. I like to sing in groups. He said, well, no, your voice is too pretty. You sang this solo. So, of course, I, you know, I was the kind of kid. I, I, my mama worked so hard. She did so much for us. I didn't want to make her upset her or make her mad. I said, okay, mom, okay, if you want me to, I will. So the first time we did it, I sung the first verse. We are Heavenly Father's children, and he all knows that he loves us one and all. I got past that. And then I got choked up. Nah, a lot of people would say I was scared. I, I, never, I was never scared. I was choked up. I don't know if he choked me up, but I, and I never get choked up, but I got choked up. I couldn't finish. So I, I kind of sat down and kept my head down. The choir finished it. My, when I got home, my mother liked to wore me out. She did everything but whip me, you know. She verbally whipped me. She said, you, <laughs> you rascal. I said, Mom, I did we, I told you, I just don't like to you know, sing solos. And I don't know what happened, Mom. I kept telling her. She said, well, next Sunday, we're going to find out because you're going to do it again. <laughs> yeah, so not, not to let my mom down, I got up there again. <laughs> and in the same spot, I got choked up. I, I just couldn't do anything. So I ran off the choir stage and all the way down the aisle and out the door. 
with my little white robe on and everything. I'm, I'm standing there in the street, not in the street, but on the sidewalk, right by the door, and tears coming out my eyes. And then there's a lady that walked by. She looked like she was dressed like one of the sisters in any of our churches where she had the little headband and she had whites. And, you know, just like a sister that would help people, you know, if they shout too loud or too much or faint or anything. <laughs> And then she walked past me, then she stopped and looked, and she said, oh, my God. And I, I said, what? She said, boy, look at all the angels around you. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't see no angels, Mom, ma'am, blah, blah, blah. She says, ooh, son. Mm -hmm. She said, I can see where you're going. She, mm -hmm. I said, what you mean? She said, you're going to be singing forever, mm -hmm. and you will be singing where you can hear the harmony, you'll be part of the harmony. Now, she didn't know I'd said that before, but she, she quoted that. She's gonna be in, a, you're gonna be in a wonderful group and they're gonna know you all over mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I really, you know, kind of perked up. And, you know, <laughs> I said, but I wanted to believe her, but I wasn't sure, you know. I said, well, I said, tell, tell me more. She said, I ain't, uh, only one thing I can get, let, got to tell you is just remember, love is always the answer. I said, how do you mean that? She said, just remember, love is the answer. Mm -hmm. And she walked away. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I was baffled. I was just truly baffled. By then, my mom had come out to find out where I was. She said, get your butt in back here in this church. I said, yes, ma'am. I mean, she was a beautiful mom, but she was, she was mad at me, you know? She, she just felt like I, I, I wasn't up to what she knew that I should be able to do. Uh, and guess what? She was so religious. Even when I started singing, I would call, you know, when we started, when we had our first engagement, I called her. I said, Mom, Mom, we got engagement working on. She said, holy, holy, boy. She said, engagement, where are doing what? I said, singing. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a singing group now. She said, oh, my Lord, you singing that devil music. I, I said, no, Mama. I said, I said, people enjoying this, see? You know, ain't no devil music. She said, son, that's devil's music. She said, now, here's what I want you to do. She said, you remember how to pray, don't you? I said, well, yes, ma'am, I, I do. She said, well, you get on your knees and you pray to God, and I guarantee you, He'll give you your answer. He'll tell you where to sing and if you need to sing at all. She <laughs> said, by the way, you took a lot, of, a lot of tests and some of these tests coming in for city job, for this job, for the state job. I said, Mama, I'm going to be a singer. I said, you can forget all that. You can forget college. She said, what? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, I should never have said that. <laughs> she almost hung up. She said, boy, you go pray. And so we, we were staying in a little kind of funky hotel uh, in Cleveland, and we all had one room just big enough to crawl in almost, and a bed, and, and a, a wash, wash mold. It wasn't a bathroom. The bathroom was, was a community bathroom <laughs> down the hall. Mm -hmm. So I, I did. I, I, I went and sat on the bed. The window was open, no air conditioned. And so I sat on the bed and kind of laid back and started praying. Uh -huh. I was a real religious young man, got baptized all around that time and all of that. My grandfather was, by the way, was the pastor of the church. And my aunties were ministers. Mm -hmm. And so did my mom become a minister. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I prayed. And I fell asleep while I was praying. I was honestly praying. Prayed my little heart out. And I started dreaming. And I saw a picture of four guys, look like us, in silver silk jackets and black tux pants, mm. bow tie sharp as mm. anybody in mm. show business or anywhere else in the world. And we were singing this song. I couldn't remember the song then. And, and I was just dreaming. Of, and the window come pow, shut, just like that. And it totally woke me up. I said, oh, I got to tell this fellas. I said, that was, the Lord just told me what I'm supposed to do. And she said, he just showed me what we were going to be doing. So I knocked on the door, woke them all up. And I told them about this particular dream. 
And so Levi, because we had known each other really well, we knew each other well, but Levi and I was very close. And he said, well, Duke, you had never lied to me, so I'm going to believe you. Mm -hmm. I said, y'all should. I said, I just, Lord just told me what we are going to do. And we need to we adhere to that. Mm -hmm. So we all grabbed hands, kept mm -hmm. hugging each other, said a little prayer, said, thank mm -hmm. you, Father, and we're going to be together forever. Mm -hmm. Because that was the sign they believed me. Mm -hmm. And that was the first instillment of our real togetherness. Mm -hmm. and we felt it. And from that day on, we lived by it. It sounds like you made a pact. It we did. It sounds like you made a promise. We did. We made a promise to each other. Yeah, yeah. Because we all had different things we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. And when they said, you, you can't give up that scholarship. I said, God, scholarship yeah. ain't going to get me nothing, not for what the Lord just told me. <laughs> and so I, I gave it up. Um, I think one of the things people really love about the Four Tops is that you never dissolved, you never broke up like most singing groups. Yeah, we you, did you not. You know, and, and you certainly had opportunities. Yeah, and, and we had a system. I mean, sometimes uh, we had to figure out what to do, and we would just sit down democratically and talk it out, and whoever won in conversation, we went with it. Right or wrong, we went with it. Most of the time, to believe it or not, it was uh, just held in my head this direction. I could make, I just seemed like I, I, I could make decisions really quick about what we were supposed to do is as if somebody was nudging me. You but know? you said that all of you all had to agree. Yes. Always. Always. It was unanimous. Unanimous. Now. That's interesting. We would argue sometimes mm -hmm. and whoever had the strongest argument, right. we, we agreed with yeah. it. And we went with it, right or wrong. And we did make some wrong decisions like that. But we just went with it, and, and that was it. And it never bothered us, because that was like a wrong step. Mm -hmm. you know, but it never really took us away from uh, the long-time goal. Mm -hmm. That's the main thing. And, and it really tightened us up even more. You know, but you did a lot for the group. I mean, I know that everyone played their part and contributed. Everybody did. But when you tell me about some of the things you did, it make, yeah. makes me smile because one of the things that you talk about is that you were the dresser. Yeah, and I still do. I, I and that's just, fascinating to me. You're the uh, sharpest guy. I tell I know. the tailor exactly what you to are. make, He's how to make it. He's always super clean. The style. I just felt I knew our style, which was always to me. Class. Once I saw us in this dream, in yeah, those that's tucks, what brought, brought it to mind. Then I, I just followed that. You know, I always they say, okay, do we, what, what, what are we gonna do? We need some uniforms. I said, well, I got an idea for, <laughs> for these uniforms, and they would go with it. You know. But you would get and, the suits cleaned, right? I was at one time. I was the road the manager. Right. I was the luggage guy. I was a little bit of everything. I don't know because I don't know whether whether I had just the energy for it or. Or, what to be, I'll be honest, I was born to do that. But I didn't know that. I just knew I had the energy to get up and, and go. And, and if it, we need to talk to an agent about trying to get some gigs, which we needed quite a bit back in those days. I did all that. And take the clothes to the cleaners, bloop, bloop, bloop. And, and whatever. I'd call the agents. And I was just very fortunate that I, I had a vision, you know, for us. And you had some good role models. You talked about mm -hmm. Daddy Braggs in Idlewild. Yep. Oh, yeah. Who you watched and followed at the resort. Yeah. Speaking of Daddy Braggs. Okay. Daddy Braggs, he owned the club up in Idlewild. A lot of you have probably been up to Idlewild, Michigan, or heard. You remember the Paradise Club and, and Daddy Braggs? Arthur Braggs, the one that owned it? Well, he became my manager. When he heard us in Detroit at an auto show, he said, well, I, boys, I think you all can work for me for the whole summer, but it's going to be after the first night. I'm going to see how they take to you. If you pass, you in for the whole summer. So we went up there very excited about all this. You know, it's a black summer resort, and, you know, it's every, and everybody was so well with each other. There were lawyers, doctors, teachers, plumbers, street yeah. clean, you know, People mixed. They didn't care about what you did or did not do. We, they just had fun together. They drank together. They made parties outside of their little cabins and all. And it, it was just a, it was just great fun. And so 
we had just watched a little bit of it just because we came up there before it opened and we saw how this Say, wow, this is great. We thought we was we thought this was one step short of heaven. This is the fifties. <laughs> this is the early, late fifties. Yeah, this was fifty six. Okay. All yeah, right. we we started in nineteen fifty four. Mm -hmm. I I graduated that Jan that January, mm -hmm. and it was right after that that we started uh, we started the group in the spring of fifty uh, four. And Daddy Braggs was very, very important in, in our young growth. Yeah. Daddy Braggs, he liked us so well, and he thought so much of us that he said, well, I'm going to get you all into Apollo. I said, what? How are you going to do that? He said, don't worry, I know folks. Well, he was, he was a good numbers man from Saginaw, big numbers man from Saginaw, by the way. But he was a wonderful guy. He owned the club. And he owned, you know, quite a few things. He owned horses that he would go race. Uh -huh. So he booked us in the Apollo after wow. the summer. Wow. And we were so excited. He said, fellas, I want you to come in town a couple of days early. And I got you all places in, in this rooming house, not too far from the Apollo. So we got there. He said, come on in this room. He told us what room to go to. We walked in the room mm -hmm. and on the bed, was three of the finest outfits I had ever seen. Mm. One of them being a silver jacket with the black pants, the tux. You know, he had the smash shoes to go with it. And a brown one, just like that. And then he had those little Eisenhower jackets, the little maroon <laughs> ones like waiters. We were as sharp as anybody in show business. I don't care who it was, Frank Sinatra, or Billy X, and you name them. We was as sharp as any of them. And then after that, when we, after we did the Apollo, and, and we did, we were a success without a record. I mean, we was getting standing ovations, and we were singing uh, old standards and a couple of songs. I, we actually sang a song that I wrote that we only sang it that one time. We're the tops, simply part of the show. We're the tops. Different Places we like to go. The Sands in Las Vegas, the Chez Paris, Cyril's in Hollywood, uh, it's the Copa for me. We're the top group. So anyway, we sung that song. And Daddy Braggs also, at the same time, bought us a station wagon with a record player in it. That blows my mind. That was, I mean, we felt like we were king. <laughs> we were as sharp as anybody. We felt like we could sing as good or more, but more better than a lot of the groups that were out there making money, you know, and we were just just getting off the ground. We were kids. But we were happy. We knew we had direction. We kind of knew where we wanted to go. And some people, you asked me where you, we thought we was going to the top. That's well, why did. we got that name. Um, and then there was another influence that you had that I really love hearing about because What's history that? is kind of not really giving him his due, and that's Billy Eckstein. Oh. And he was also one of your show Billy business Eckstein. dads. Tell us about him. Billy Eckstein was like our father in show business. Billy Eckstein had heard about these four young black guys that could sing anything, you know, standards, R&B, pop, country. And he had just recorded an album with the High Lows, you know, so he wanted to keep a group quartet sound behind him on stage. So he had heard about us and gave us a call and said he would like us, he flies out to California and he'd like us to audition for him. And if we auditioned well, then he would take us on the road as his backup group for a year or two. So that really just, because back then in the 50s, Billy Eckstein was a big fella. And, and if he hadn't messed around with this uh, Denise Darcel, he was big as Frank Sinatra when that happened, and they started cutting, cutting down on him. They just, they almost blackballed him from all the really big clubs at first. But he kind of worked his way back into the business, but not at the level that he should have been. But he was an amazing singer, an amazing entertainer. He was oh, smooth he was, and classy. He was, he he was, was one the of top. the sharpest dresser, dressers. He had poise and class on stage, and we would just watch him in amazement. If you watch Levi on stage, he's a perfect example of Billy Eckstein. Mm -hmm. We learned so much from that guy. I remember when, at the very beginning, we was on stage, we was having fun, 
and we was kind of doing our little steps, and I could see he was kind of frowning. Oh, that's funny. So he looked back at us and kind of said, what's going wrong? We were just singing and backing him up. So when we got off stage, he said, come here, you little rascals. I said, what? He said, dog it. I hired you all to sing. I said, damn it, y'all doing all those <laughs> steps. He says, at the end of the song, y'all flat as a pancake. <laughs> Wow. I and had he you was to right. Sing. I had yeah, you to sing. So we, we always moved and, and, and did choreography, but we cut it down. We didn't, you know, we didn't do as much of it. And uh, that was another, the sec, another lesson. Uh, right about that same time, this was the first few weeks we was working with him. He looked back there and I could see that look on his face again. So when we come off the stage, we said, Bell, uh, B, it's got something for us. I don't know what it is. So he said, let me cut, tell y'all something. He said, if you don't watch them damn shirts, they'll watch them. Watch. <laughs> I see the ring around the collar from where I'm standing. God dog it, blah, blah, blah. Don't ever come on my stage like that. And he was right. We had not watched the shirts, you know. That's the first you told me So that we one. started watching them every night. Because no, no. we didn't have one, we, you know, we had a shirt for each outfit. But we would wash it as soon as we got off, you know. And there were so many wonderful lessons that he got taught to us. Another, another very important one. We were finishing up one night, and he said, he said, Duke, before you leave, look, look out there. Oh, yeah. Look at the audience. So I looked out there, you know, people were still sitting there again getting ready to leave. I said, you know, it looked like the same people to me. It's, you know, wonderful house, maybe a thousand people or whatever. He said, what you see is my fans. Mm -hmm. He said, Duke, if you treat them people, mm -hmm. treat them like you love them and you mm -hmm. thank them, mm -hmm. they'll take care of you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Good lesson. How true that was. It's a good lesson. And you know, and it's not a pretense that we have to do that. It's just from our hearts. Mm -hmm. We always treated people like people, special. I mean, everyone to me is special. They all bought a ticket or they all bought a record. They all helped me somewhere down the line. And I, mm -hmm. I, I always think about that. Mm -hmm. I, I got so many stories. Well, let's, let's jump I, but, you know, I don't want to talk all the time. Let's all talk the time. Because my life is a story. Yeah. What about Mary Gordy? I hmm? know, I mean, we're talking about pre Motown. Yes. But then the miraculous, you know, leap that you made. Barry Gordy came to sign you early on. Yeah. And you were not well, ready. You well, weren't ready. You know what? I'm going to put it here's the way it really happened. Because okay. I don't think Barry remembered. When Barry first started his record company in 1959, you know, he was. Um, he was taking pictures in the nightclubs with his uh, two sisters. Uh, and we knew him quite well, and he was writing songs wow. with Lawrence Payton's cousin, uh, Billy Roquel Davis. They wrote Repetite and all those songs. So we knew, we, you know, we knew Barry as, as a songwriter, because he always, even in, in the Flame Show Bar where they'd be taking pictures of folks, he had his little box, you know, and he'd listen to music while they'd be doing wow. things, yeah. So when he started the record company, Billy came to us, not, not, see, not wow. Barry. And he said, dude, you know, Bill, Barry started his record company. Oh. He said, I can get you all in there. Y'all want, want to sign with him? I said, hell no. So, you know, they, there was two record companies in Detroit at that time, and they were the worst. I mean, they were just stealing, and they weren't promoting records. They were just, you know, they were just the name of a record company. Yeah. And that's what we thought about. It, a black company, of course. Uh, so not not of course, but that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so we said no, and we said yeah, he, he you know he might be all right, but uh, we're not gonna take a chance. You know, we we thinking outside the box. You know, we want to go to record companies that has this stuff all over the country, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And that we did. We traveled around from one company, started at Chess. Mm -hmm. Then we went to Columbia. We mm -hmm. went the same time that Aretha went to Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, and at, the, at that time, the deal was, okay, you all, his, his four songs, because we wanted a name, so they didn't offer us hardly anything. That, you know, his, we're going to record four songs for you guys. 
If one of them hit, then we'll make a real record deal. Mm. Well, at least one of these companies, it never hit, you know. Mm. From Chess, it didn't. Columbia, it didn't. You know, my family bought all the records. <laughs> <laughs> that was my, <laughs> and, I, and our family, those were the only, rec only records that sold. And finally, we were in New York with, with another record company, Riverside, and we were recording at that time. And that's when, this was quite a few years, years later, this was like 62 or 63. And we heard of the Motortown Review at the oh, Apollo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we say, well, let's, let's go. We knew most of them, they were kids to us. They were like seven, eight years younger than us. And we had started listening to the radio a lot and Motown was starting to sell a lot of records. Yeah. So we was saying to ourselves, man, man maybe we should <laughs> you know, sign with them. Well, let's go see what they look like. So we went to the Apollo and we watched you watch this show, and we got really excited. We said, that's a good show, but oh, we would be dynamite in that show. <laughs> and that's when we decided, look, we need to be there. So uh -huh. we kept talking, so after the show we kept talking, how can we get in touch with Barry? Right after we saw that show, we were working up in the Catskill Mountains, and we were recording. All that's all, all in the same was framework of maybe a week, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. One guy up in the Catskill Mountains saw us. He worked for The Tonight Show, with Steve Allen was the host mm -hmm. then. And he says, Steve Allen would like to have you guys on the show. He says, uh, we've seen you all up here, and you all do a fantastic show. I love the way you sound. You look great. You need to be, you need to be somewhere, so we're going to give you a shot on Tonight Show. We said, wow. We thought that was the beginning of a new world for us. So, we did, on, we did uh, that show, and we sang in the still of the night, you know, in like four-part mm -hmm. harmony, which was very different for, for black guys. Dress well, look well, and all of that. It was, it was a real pretty good hit on that show. Well, Barry was sitting there with William R. Stevenson, who was his... Uh, uh, A&R guy. That's right. He was, he was in Detroit guy. watching you on TV. Yeah, they were in Detroit watching mm -hmm. on TV. And Barry mm -hmm. said, you know what? I've always liked those tops. You know, I keep hearing how they sing. They look. We don't have anything like them in our stable. He said, do you know them, uh, William R? He said, sure, I know them. We play golf together sometimes. So he said, can you get in touch? He said, absolutely. So he did get in touch with us. He called. He knew Obi a little better than, you know, than he knew me because they, they were golfers together. That was before I really started playing a lot. And he said, Barry Gordy would like to talk to you all. We were still in a contract with Riverside Records. We was working on one of those four, uh, four song deals. You know, we just walked away from that. We got on, we, we got on, the, on the bus and <laughs> headed back to home. We said, shoot, forget this. So we could not wait to get back. And as soon as we got back, we was looking at Hisville as we walked up there. When we got to them steps, we kind of said a prayer to each other. Yeah. We did. We, yeah. we, we reunited again yeah. and said, I think this, we think this is where we should be. Yeah. Said, Let's hope this is our last stop for. Yeah. You know, for the recording. And his genius in putting you with HDH. Yeah. That a master stroke. Yeah. Well, it was. It was. But he, you know, at first he had us recorded a jazz album. Which is what appealed to you. Yeah. That's right. what he, you know. Yeah. Because that's what he wanted. You know, we were different and he wanted, you know, and he thought that would work. So we recorded about 20 different songs with the big band, 20 piece band, with the little band, seven piece band. Uh, then we did a live one at the Greystone. We yeah. recorded five or six songs there. And you started a jazz label. Hmm? He was starting a jazz label, wasn't he, with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was going to be a jazz label. Right, I mean, we at were Motown. excited. I mean, yeah. wow, we was going to have our own label at, with Motown and blah, blah. We was sky high. Mm -hmm. So after about almost a year of recording, he called us up. He said, fellas, he said, y'all did a wonderful job. He said, those songs are really nice. He said, but, he said, we're starting to sell a lot of R&B songs and crossover songs, but, but they're charts type songs. They're not the old standards and, and things that, 
you know, the jazz lovers and people in Detroit has always liked so well. He says, I, I think we're going to put these songs on the shelf. Our faces just went, oh, gee whiz. You must have felt like a failure. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, to us, yeah. you know, it was like getting kicked to the curb almost, you know. Mm. But that didn't last, but, you know, just a few minutes, really. He said, hey, wait, wait, wait. He said, they are still great singers. He said, I'm just going to put you all with somebody that I think can get you all some hit records, because mm -hmm. that's what we're doing now. We have hit mm -hmm. records and lots of them. He said, this team, Holland, Dozier, and Holland, mm -hmm. I believe can write you all some hits. Mm -hmm. So he said, William R., take them down to meet, wow. meet them. Yeah. So we went you know, down to their office. All the, all the writers and uh, producers had their own offices in that little building, or little room, in the little office is what I call it. Uh, we said, well, we know them, you know, so we got introduced. And, William Ma said, can you write these boys a hit? He said, so Eddie said, as good as they sing, yeah, we'll write them a hit. It might take a little while, but we sure love working with them. And that began, began a really wonderful mm -hmm. friendship. That's lasted all mm -hmm. the years, because in our musical, they've written about seven mm -hmm. original songs. Mm -hmm. uh, they write well for us. I call them the tailors of music, you know? But they have been writing office. for a while. They weren't writing for a while. And when oh, they, they heard did. the musical, yeah. they're like, we're, we're involved. I know. We're going to write you some music. They were, they were like almost in retirement. Yeah. You know, but they got enough money. I mean, their records are played everywhere in the world constantly. You know, they've got plenty of money, so they didn't have to you know, do a lot. But when I asked, I asked them you know, to write some songs for the musical, they were excited. It was just like back in the day. We had a great relationship, you know. We wrote, I mean, we sang good, really well, the songs that they wrote. You know, Levi would turn this song into. But the new songs, those mm -hmm. new songs are incredible. They are. Oh my God. They I are. mean, they there's still one right. of the songs I told somebody, I said, look, that they, make you cry. You don't lose that kind of talent. It's amazing. Especially if you're writing for the people that you've written many hits for. Mm -hmm. You know them, you know how they sound and all that. So they, it's some wonderful music that they've written that's in this musical that we're in pre-production right now. Uh, and there's some, of course, our classics are definitely all the way through there. And there's some other songs that we would sing when we first started. Yeah. So it, to yeah. me, it's going to be really a colorful, colorful, colorful event. Musically, that's going to take you from the 50s mm -hmm. all the way up to the 90s or mm -hmm. 2000. And seeing it on stage with the enhancement of lights and sets and mm -hmm. of course great music back up, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, it's gonna be really exciting. So I'm really excited. I'm, you know, this next step, that's what I call it, taking my next step. I'm just as excited as if it's the first one. You know, this, you know to have a musical that you think, what, what we told it may, it may be one that travels the world because we are liked everywhere in in the world and it's it's very fortunate even now you know we we sell records in even now in all the countries australia japan um, all of europe mm -hmm. especially uk um, we're very fortunate we didn't just i i say that but we're more blessed than fortunate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to be honest and that's the real truth. There were so many questions I forgot to ask you when we were working on the book, and now today I thought, wow, I can ask Duke some stuff I didn't ask him. Well, but the, don't I, dig so too deep. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just going to, I'm not going to hit you with all the questions, I'm but I have kidding. one, because yeah. I know we're getting short of time. Mm -hmm. You mean I've been talking all that time? Oh, it's been going beautifully. Come on, girl. I love your stories. Mm -hmm. um, Guess what Piper told me in the car? What? She said, Duke, now don't you take up all the time talking, you know. <laughs> she, she said, once you get the role, That's she said, funny. you can't stop. Because, you know, I was married to a singer. Yes, you were. A and great singer. He at was that. a great singer, and I would attend his clubs, you know, when he sang. And he loved to talk. Yeah. And he would start talking between the songs. Oh, yeah. And I would sit in the audience, and after a while, I would call up, sing, sing Carl, sing. Yeah. Sing. yeah. <laughs> um, but you guys are entertainers, you know, well, so there's, you know, a, 
there's that quality that you like communicating. There's things that I'd like the people to know. Yeah. That's the whole story. And, and audiences that, re that really like you, they want to know more Absolutely. about you Absolutely. than just to see you up there just and you sing a song and then go on. You know, I always try to kind of talk about the song coming up, what we went through, uh, different things. That's, you, you set it up. You know, you get their imagination going and, and you give them a little history along with what you're doing. And that lets them know a little more about you. And they do, because they. I found out they really do want to know. Yeah. You know, they feel like fans. they know you anyway. Yeah. You know, when they come to the concert, they've been yeah. loving you for so long. Yeah. You know, and now they get a little glimpse into your personal life yeah. and your personality, and that's a wonderful thing to share. Well, between the book, which is the literary story of our lives, that a lot of people in the, a lot of things in the book will tell people more about this than they thought or they knew. And then comes the musical, which is the literary covered with the beautiful music and the arrangements and the color lights. It's an enhancement <laughs> of that same story. And it's just, I can see it, it's just gonna be, and I, you know, I, I'm not bragging, I'm just proud. I'm just proud that we have that kind of material and we have that kind of a life and story that we think people is gonna love hearing and seeing. And it's, it's that simple. And I think they're gonna love it they're all over the world. So it's, my last question for you is? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> all of them, all of them, that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Excuse me. I know that you love your first hit, you know, the first HDH hit, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch. The right? first one was Baby I Need Your Baby I Need Your Lovin'. But yeah. what is your favorite Four Top song? Other than that one, so the second favorite. I oh, never yeah, asked you that. Baby I Need You Love Me is my favorite. That's your first. Because it right? was life changing. Okay. I mean, it started right away. We start, our life started changing just dramatically, wonderfully dramatically. So your uh, second favorite, because I know that one. Well, yeah. commercially? No, your no, heart. I'm, I'm going to answer with two different ones. Okay. C commercially, it would be Reach Out. I'll be there. Okay. The name but of, the name one of your I would musical. love on stage singing other than, other than our biggest hit is MacArthur Park. That's just a great song. It's like a concerto. It has so many different movements. And the music is beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. if you sing mm -hmm. anything like beautiful or mm. nice, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a great song. And I think we did a pretty, pretty wonderful and kind of clever job on it. And I'm just, I love hearing it. I love, I, I love hearing anybody that sang that song because it, it touches me somewhat kind of way. Sometimes I ask myself, well, did you leave something left? Did you leave something in the rain? Yeah. I say, yeah. I say well, I got Piper, so I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think everybody looks back, but many people look back at their life and they think, what was that one thing that if I could recapture I would get back, but it's too late. You know, we look, reflect like that. Mm -hmm. So it's like the cake that got left out in the rain, rain yeah. you know, and I think we yeah, relate I mean, to that. It, somehow or another, it relates to something that I feel or felt, you know, and it's it just, it just a wonderful song. I like it too. And I, I love the way I like that, it too. Yeah, I, I love the harmonies that we did, but I love the way that Levi delivered it. You know, he did deliver it with a lot of feeling. But you do it now with this, with the concert that you do with the New Tops. Yeah, correct? well, the New Tops, we, we're working on it, but we haven't put that together yet. I, I tell see. you, it, it's good, but it doesn't, it doesn't ring yet. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. they got, they, they're singing notes. I see. You know, they don't feel it yet. I see. And that's a song that we all felt. I mean, sometimes we'd be looking at each other almost crying, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes when we, when we came in, the way those violins and stuff would leave the background in, that we would sing four-part harmony, it was just it, it's about as pretty as it, as it can get. I mean, I musically. Agree. I agree. You know, and it's, it's just amazing. So until, we, until I can, until, until the four of us can recapture close to that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, we won't do it on stage, but we're working on it, you know. But it's hard for new members, even though they're, they're talented and they're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But 
they didn't come through what we came through. Mm -hmm. They don't feel everything yes. that we feel mm -hmm. or felt, you know. And he, but they're they're doing a great job. I'm not I'm not talking them down. We're talking about higher up uh, mm -hmm. nitpicking, you know. And that's what I'm doing. But they're a good group, you know. They all of them are very musically inclined. Uh, the lead singer, he, he's a preacher, uh, and he, uh, he knows how to handle that stage. Uh -huh. Yes, he does good. What's his name? Uh, Alex Morris. Okay. And Lawrence Payton Jr., who's was the son of Lawrence Payton, the guy with the great ear, uh, he's just like his dad, only he's on the stage, around the stage like Obi. Uh -huh. um, he just can't keep still. He's all over the place. <laughs> Uh -huh. which, was, which was like OB at times. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good show. People say the show is great. Yeah. I, I, to me, it's a good show. Yeah. Uh, well done, but it still doesn't have the magic that I felt so many years, you know. And I'm still working on it, and I'm keep working on it till we can get it. If we don't, if we don't get it before too long, because I ain't got too many years left. Shoot. Well, I saw the show, yeah, and I, I love the show. Oh, thank you. I it's appreciate just, that. It's just, that was a wonderful show. Well, everybody show. has said the show I is really show. good. Yeah. I do. Yeah. But uh, evidently, um, you know, I, I miss my three buddies. Of course you do. Because, you know, I, I, I don't try to make the guys to be like them. I just want them to sing with the feeling that we had. That's all. You know, notes. Everybody can sing notes. That's, that's what we had to learn at Motown. Now, we had been on the road for nine years. We'd worked in supper clubs. We worked in lounges. We'd worked in Vegas. We worked in Montreal. And we could entertain. But we did not know how to record until we got to Motown. Mm -hmm. There is a way to sing into a mic mm -hmm. when you don't see. When you're used to having an audience and, and you, you give people things and they give it back to you, that keeps you going. In the studio, it's just that microphone. It, we had to learn how to sing in a studio. You know, that's why we never had any, any luck or you know, success in any other record company, because mm -hmm. we would just be singing words or notes, mm -hmm. you know? And the feeling was not there, because the songs were, they were all songs to me that were on the fence. They were neither here nor there. They weren't R&B, they weren't pop. They were just songs that they, those, the, the people that wrote for us thought because we could sing almost anything, they would write, <laughs> write a song <laughs> that was on the pop, but it wasn't nowhere. I mean, it was, it was just sitting on the fence, just sitting up there, you know? It didn't have that oomph, it didn't have the soul, it didn't have the vibrance or, you know, anything. They didn't know that Levi, if you take the key and put it up a couple keys higher, so, so Levi, I had to reach them notes and so you could feel that cry <laughs> in his voice. Yeah, uh, yeah. They didn't know none of that. Holland, Doge and Holland knew it and they did it on purpose. Yeah. They found out how Levi could make a feeling way up there. And they didn't realize how high he could sing. See, Levi has a tenor range, but he's got a baritone voice. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's hard, it's rough, and you know, and it's real and he's very the words are very distinct. I love the way he yeah, says the yeah. words. You hear and understand everything he says and do, but he has that extra feeling when he wants to reach something. I mean, Eddie Holland told me, he said, dude, you know, it's incredible. I would, I would work with Levi on these melodies, and every time he would add something that just blew my mind. I didn't know he could reach that note. Yeah. And he would just go up there and get it. Yeah. And he's, you know, and it was just amazing, you know. And, and he did it with feeling. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't operatic. You know, it was just, mm -hmm. that's all I can say. Just, just look at me, <laughs> that's all. Yes. And he would go and get <laughs> those notes or that <laughs> phrase. And, and it just, it, it was very fortunate. He could touch anybody. He could touch anybody with, those, with the way he delivered those words. You know, and and it would, and that helped us make harmonies to back him up with that kind of feeling. Yeah. As much you yeah. know, close to that feeling, the three of us would do along with the feeling that he has established. 
And I think that's how you get classic records, you know. Uh, somebody else could have sang Bernadette. I don't think it would have been as potent no. as the way we, as no. Levi, the way Levi delivered it, no. and how he reached those notes, and he and he cried out yeah. for Bernadette. Yeah. Every time I talked to Aretha on the phone, phone, that's what she would say, Bernadette. <laughs> 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 she, she was saying that to me. She that was a song that she loved. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think wasn't that Barry Gordy's favorite too? It might have been. I think I've heard yeah. that. It's his yeah. favorite Motown. Yeah. Don't want to misquote Barry Gordy. Well, so Barry I just was wanted... a real fan mm -hmm. of ours. You know? Yeah, yeah. But he was a businessman. But he was a fan. He enjoyed. He enjoyed the tops, so like he did. You know, a lot of other artists. Right, but right. he certainly enjoyed Le 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 uh, You know, the tops, and he respected Levi tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, thank you, Duke. I know we have to take questions and answers, right? But thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you for letting me write this book. Okay. Question? Yes, sir. Hi. My name is Ray Cloud. I'm a former chief of staff for Congressman Congress. And what you guys need to know is this man's activism. Because he was always in D.C. fighting for the rights of artists to get royalties that, they, that belong to them. Oh, that's great. Oh, yes, yes. I did do that. Yeah. You didn't talk about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Even, even my writer, she didn't know that. But no, I, I didn't. We have to do part two. You know, two for the musical rights that. for singers, horn players, background singers, they, went, they, don't, they weren't getting royalties from singing. Only the writer was getting royalties, mm. and you would get royalties for selling. And that started way back in 1909, because mm. uh, it was just writers and a piano. So they didn't think of background singers mm. and, and stuff like that, and or, or radio play that you get paid when it's played on the radio. We hadn't gotten paid for years and years and years, and that always bothered me. So when, uh, when our union started putting up a, a fight for this, I, I joined right in. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would go to, and talk to, to Congress, to the senators, uh, and I had a good story. Uh, I think they would listen to me because it was the truth, mm -hmm. you, know? But, you know? I was saying, how can you all, I mean, how can the record industry just pay the people that write the song when it's played on the radio when on the radio, advertisers are paying that money in for the song being delivered a certain way. They love the song. That's why they keep putting money into the pot, not just for the music. And one of my stories was I'm standing up in front of some congressmen and senators. I say, try to play Bernadette without Levi singing it. Play that and see if you go by it. And they, they laughed, and you know, so I, I sang Levi's part for a minute. I said, that makes all the difference in the world. People buy that record because of what is being sung, not just us, I mean, the Shirelles, the Temptation. And just recently, because of a lot of our fights going to Congress and to the Senate, uh, we started getting digital royalties. Nice. Yeah, and, and they come every month. Uh, but it also, Something's been going on that it, our records are being streamed like never before. Because what is old, somehow or another, this business is new. Yeah. They are, people are buying older stuff, you know, like candy, you know. And it's, I was surprised at how things have shifted this pleasantly, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, so it, it, you know, I, I, I really took a lot of pride in, in yeah. doing that. Yeah. You know, I just, I always felt that, I even went to Barry when we first started uh, recording and, and Holland Dozier and Holland was getting, at royalty time was a big party at Motown, you know. So <laughs> they, they, they were getting checks. Uh, we didn't get none. I said, what? I said, what's going on? I said, uh, Eddie, Eddie, how come y'all get these checks? He said, oh, these are just writers. I said, you mean the ones that's writing, the only ones getting those kind of checks, blah, blah, blah? He said, yeah. I said, well, what about when, 
when the people hear our records on the radio, don't we get money from that? He said, uh -huh. I said, well, let me go talk to Barry. So I went up there, knocked on his door. He said, hey, come on in, Duke. Blah, blah, blah. So I talked to him. He said, well, that's just the way the business is. Oh. There's nothing I can do about it. We don't, they don't pay you when, you when the radio plays it. So I just started doing my little fight. I got so good, uh, they would call me a designated hitter. You know, when they had a, a senator or a congressperson they really needed, to, you know, somebody to talk to, they would call me up and help me come to Washington. And I would do, I would come and do that and tell my story. And it, it, evidently it worked. Mary Wilson was good at that too. I wasn't the only one. There was a lot of other artists mm -hmm. that did it. But I was mm -hmm. proud of, mm -hmm. of doing what I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell you all that. Though, no, didn't. you didn't. I'm we, didn't we didn't even put I'm that in the book. I'm impressed. It would have been in the book, too, I bet yeah, you. Yeah, it would have. Well, yeah. maybe the next one. How's I that? think there's got to be a part two. Hmm? Yeah. I think we need to do part two. Well, there's, there's a part there's two a to my life. There's a lot of material. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much material. Yeah, that we it, have enough. it was. Mm -hmm. Yes, Han. Um, it just makes me so proud that you stayed here um, after becoming legendary. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I've stayed, we've stayed here because we've loved, we've loved Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, when Motown was moving to the West Coast, mm -hmm. uh, we were recording with a record company from the West Coast. Mm -hmm. The record company said, well, you know, it'd be nice if you come out here. And Motown said, well, you know, it'd be nice. Everybody else was going out there. And, but after going out there and seeing what LA was, which is a beautiful place, wonderful, but I was not going to raise my family out there. There was just something about it just to me would have been too show busy. You know, it wouldn't have, the family life would have been minuscule. It, you know, it would have been, I think it would have hurt me deeply. I really do believe that, you know. So we all believe that, say, hey man, this is home. I ain't going nowhere. And this is, I still feel that way, this is home. Yeah. I might get to, we might have a little extra place, but this is home, always will be. Mm -hmm. And it's, Detroit has given us a lot. A lot of people don't know that we learned a lot about resiliency, you know, about giving it your all and giving, you know, and not taking, you know, just work hard. You know, we used to seeing people work hard to do what they do, some of them just to get a few dollars a week, but in everything, people in Detroit works hard and they work at what they're doing. That's true. You know, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a plumber, you know, whether whatever it is, and we learned that. Uh, we learned that also from, from a numbers man. He was a classy guy, but he was, he was illegal, <laughs> but he did it the right way. He did it and he did it big time and he was good at it, you know? So, I mean, that's, that's all part of drive. You, know, you have to have a drive, you have to have a dream, and you have to have set your goals up high. And Detroit is do it. You know, some of them can only set them so high, but God bless them, they go, they do the best they can. Yeah. And that's all that's required of any of us. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that throughout the years, and I just love this hometown of mine, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I remember years ago on the plane, be sitting next to somebody, said, you still live in Detroit? I'll be ready for him. I said, yeah, I still live in Detroit. <laughs> What's wrong with Detroit? <laughs> uh, so anyway, those have changed. I just let it go by. Because Detroit is, is beautiful downtown. And coming. It's coming. It's, it's coming. It's taking it's time. Good. It's good. I remember before Aretha Franklin passed, she would drive by my house and say, dude, you got to go downtown. She said, it's so beautiful down there. She said, I just ride down through there almost every day. She said, I ain't moved down there. I said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll go down there pretty soon. She loved, she's another one that loved her city. And mm. I don't know, you know, it, 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 it's something maybe good about it that helps you along the way. 
but it, it just I guess it shows you're steady. You ain't you know you don't you ain't fickle. You don't have to move with everything that looks nice. You know, you go with what you got and what you learn and what mm -hmm. you built mm -hmm. was built in you, you know. Mm -hmm. And it sure paid off. God bless America. Detroit, I mean. <laughs> Any more questions? What's that? You talked a lot about your mother and ventilation, you know, love. Can you speak a little bit about your father? Oh, I can speak a lot about my father. My father was uh, what you call an East Indian. He was, he was born and raised in what is now Bangladesh, but when he was there it was East India. Uh, he would sit on the street and he made guitars and he would sing on the street. He made enough money to go to London because he was really trying to get to America. He heard that the factories were paying the same amount of money whether you were black, red, or white for just hard work. And he liked that. And to this, back then, you know, that's a, that was a lot of money that was being made in the factories, mm -hmm. even though now it doesn't look like it, but it was. He worked, he made his way to London and he worked in the kitchen. He was a great cook. He, you know, he taught me how to make the curries and all those different things. He, and he could really do it. Yeah. He worked in the kitchens. He made enough money to catch a steamboat. Like, then, you know, it wasn't a real passenger boat, but he took the boat to Canada. And he got off Canada in Windsor, got, walked up to the Detroit River. He saw Detroit across. And he swam to Detroit. Yes, he swam all the way to Detroit from Windsor. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he, he, he was born, he was raised in, a, in, in the south of India, where it's the, the river, the Indian River, Indian Ocean is there. And he was always by the water. He was a swimmer. He wasn't a beginner jumping in. I mean, he knew he could get across, evidently. Oh, if he didn't know it, he'd know he was going to try like hell. And he did. He, he made it to Detroit, and then he, uh, he met my mom and, and, diff and different things. From, he met her on the North End. That's where he started living. And he got a job. My granddaddy got him a job at Briggs Manufacturing Company. Mm -hmm. You heard of that. He worked there until he retired. Uh, he and my mom broke up when I was about five or six. They broke up after six ch children. Because he, now, he was a devout Muslim and she was a devout Christian. So eventually that got in the way. Mm. So they decided to just split up and they got divorced, you know. Uh, but he was, he was there for us every weekend. He would come get us and take us to breakfast and just stuff like that. And of course he paid mama her alimony right on through. Uh, he, to me, he was a great dad. I, I loved him. I loved him dearly. Uh, one time, I went and stayed with him. He stayed down on Vernon Highway in just a little apartment. And <laughs> I was in high school then. I was going to Persian. Uh, and the bus strikes hit when I decided to stay down there with him. Every morning, I would have to walk from Vernon Highway up to Seven Mile and down Seven Mile to Persian mm -hmm. High. And I did that for about a week. And then I had to walk back at night after basketball practice or football practice or whatever one, because I played all the football, basketball, and track, thank God. So, and I did have a basketball scholarship. I wasn't bad. I wasn't bad at all. I wasn't great, but I wasn't bad. I'm glad I didn't take that scholarship. That's all I can say. <laughs> Shit, I'd have been out the business 30 years ago. But that was one of my favorite parts of what you told me that wound up in the I book, thought, yeah. was how far you had to walk from your dad's house to school and back. And back, yeah. I think you said it was seven or eight miles. Yes, I, and you, you know, didn't From Vernon mind. Highway to Seven Mile. And you loved that's, it. That is all, that's almost seven miles. So you miles. could be with your dad. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah, well, he... he, he, he Evidently, he gave me a lot as well as my mom. You know, they, they, a lot of both of them is in, in me. Uh, one thing they, they gave me is go for it. Do it, do it from the heart. You know, it took my mama from when I started singing in 1954 to 1972 before she would 
come to see her son saying. Mm -hmm. Well, she was a preacher. She just didn't believe in it. So we were working here in Detroit. I forget the name of the place, but it was like a supper club. And I had her sit right there in the front row and eat dinner and all that. And we had just put out, ain't no woman like the one I got. And so her and the family were sitting there, right there under the stage. And when we started singing that song, she nodded her head. Yeah. That was yeah. not yeah. That's a sweet, I always wanted. That's very sweet. The nod you always wanted. Yeah. Thank you all.